don't know about the most, one of the most knowledgeable, but hopefully uh, uh, the knowledge we'll provide today would be helpful for everyone attending. Um, so this is will be a very basic introduction to metabolic modeling uh, workshop. So if you are interested in seeing some more advanced, um, uh, more advanced tooling, we did a, an, an advanced workshop like last month. And uh, I think if you can ask for it in the, uh, if you look at the what Ben sent here, maybe if you want to see that video, maybe you can ask for it. Uh, where is the link for so you can see that video but here i'm just really looking to give you like the basics because we've seen these webinars and people are at different levels and uh and it's not just metabolic models some people are at different levels on using kbase so really just going to try to cover the basics here so the link to these slides are also here. If you look at the Q&A the Q&A form, there's a link to the slides over here. And actually, when it talks about a link to a narrative, I'm I'm actually going to paste the link to this narrative here there too because even we're going to glance over this tutorial a little bit. So this is a great tutorial for you to get started. It has a lot of detail and I'll we'll get to it. So actually, I'm just going to paste it over here as well. I'm going to post it here as well. Okay. So, and also you can um, also get questions at me at JPL Faria, Faria on Twitter as well, if you want to uh, continue the conversation there as well. So here, so we're just like, let's start a little bit. So what I wanted to, um, to start with is can you guys still see my screen can you verify ben that the full screen worked out well yep all right just a small introduction uh first just really trying to understand talk about a little bit what is a metabolic modeling what you can do with it um uh what you can do with it so the main thing here so metabolic models are, are can be a key to predict and phenotype from genotype and uh, very simple, like when we talk about what is a, what is a metabolic model, we talked about a, a list of all reactions involving in metabolic pathways, a list of rules associated with gene activity. So in this case, it's important to know what gene uh, maps to which function and what functionality is linked to an enzyme and that enzyme is linked to a reaction. So we need to have this information um, available and then a biomass reaction listing the essential building blocks needed for growth and division. So here you see an example, just all the essential building blocks such as amino acids and nucleotides and lipids, for example. So this is basically what a metabolic model is. And then what a metabolic model can do, for example, we talk about prediction of cultures, conditions, and possible response to environmental changes. So this is, for example, and we have, I've used this in my own research, where you're trying to figure out if an organism will grow in a different media. So we can use a model to simulate different media, uh, different medias, and based on those different medias, the, um, you, you could try to run a simulation beforehand, particularly if you want to try a, bu a bunch of different substrates, to try to help you make a, decide, a decision about how you go about uh, growing a, a certain organism. Or also, uh, I, we have seen people that have used these to try to discover media for what they thought before was a previously unculturable organism, uh, uh, isolate, and they were able to use these tools to try to uh, tune their media. Predict metabolic capabilities for, from prototypes, predict impact of genetic perturbations, for example, so you can do gene knockouts. Um, with, uh, with a metabolic model, you can try to simulate things such as uh, with expression uh, data and metabolomics data so that we won't cover that today. But there's a lot of things that you can try to do basically to aid you on your research. We see this uh, as going hand in hand with your experimental research. If you are an experimental researcher where you can use the model to help you with decisions and you can iterate as you go. Um, Another, another important thing, so 
the main, how do we go about generating these models? So the main thing is that we start with genome annotation. We start with genome annotation, and then from genome annotation, we, 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 need, uh, we need reactions. So basically, this is the classic representation where you go from a gene to a functional role, you, to a complex, to a, to a reaction. And for example, in this case, you see that the complex, you'll need the two subunits. For this reaction to be present, basically what this is telling you, if we look at a genome annotation and this subunit, for example, would be, was, would be missing from the, from the genome annotation, this reaction would not make it into the genome because what this reaction in, in order to be encoded requires the two subunits to be present. Uh, so how do we do this? Like how do we, uh, what data do we use? Uh, basically this is actually very exciting. If you can see here, this was posted today. So this is the, uh, just like a new version of our data, of the database that we use to uh, the biochemistry database. So it's very important that we have a comprehensive biochemistry database so that we can map to uh, uh, functional roles and this is basic this this paper we're just uh, announcing the release of the latest version of the model seed, model seed database that you may or not be familiar already but more importantly it does integrate um, compounds from all of the major uh, databases that you may know such as CAG and MetaPsych or or big and uh, with all the structures available and so there's if you we can check out the paper and see a very comprehensive uh, analysis and how we're going about integrating as much as biochemistry as, as possible for the sole purpose of metabolic modeling. So that's the, the unique thing about this one is the, uh, is the, the focus on, uh, on metabolic modeling. And as I mentioned before, so this is the, um, the cycle of an validation and reconciliation that you could do as you look, you have a annotation, you build a model, you can have predictions compared with experimental data, um, validate your predictions or, or, or figure out uh, that there was something wrong with the model, uh, tune the model, iterate and uh, walk towards having a better predictive model. And then, so the reason we're going to touch on this now is that um, after you have a model, you want to simulate a model to, uh, to run your uh, to simulate the, some of the, ex, the, the possible experiments that we mentioned before, such as growth in different media, such as knockouts. And what we use uh, is flux balance analysis. There are other methodologies available for, to simu for, for these type of simulations. Here, we just wanna touch only on flux balance analysis. And so basically everything that I'm touching in these slides, it's something that you will then see in an app in KVs when we jump to KVs. So that was kind of the goal today is just give you a short introduction and then we jump into KBase so you can see how things work into KBase. So the uh, flux balance analysis, uh, the, the underlying, it's an optimization, we rerun an optimization problem when we do a uh, flux balance analysis here. So basically uh, we want to see the flow of the metabolites through a network. We assume steady state, which means that no internal metabolites are allowed to accumulate or, or degrade. So for example, what that means is if we had in this case, just like a number like 10 of a given nutrient coming, coming into the system, it's at each reaction, it's at each step, it's converted from in this case, react from A to B and B to C all the way to a uh, biomass and you can see that since there's no, we're some steady state and there's no internal accumulation, we have the same amount going through the entire network until we get our biomass. So this is pretty straightforward. Uh, in this case, it's just, this would be like a, a linear pathway. It's pretty straightforward to understand how the, um, the, the flux is going through the network. But if you were to have you know, cells are way more complicated than that. This is just like a slightly, what would be more complicated example where, for example, the path that could be chosen by the organism would be go from the nutrients and just straight to some byproduct. You could just go in this straight line towards the, uh, the biomass, for example, or they'll, or you could take this other path. So these are three, as far as the flux balance analysis, these are all valid solutions. These are, these are all probable cases. Um, 
that so there could be infinite combinations and there is a um we're not going to dive deep into uh, optimization problems uh, in, in into optimization here but in when you're looking at uh, an organism with uh, a couple uh, a couple thousands of reactions in a model this becomes a um uh, a very big problem as far as optimization it can become a very big problem as far as optimization to solve and so for example here you could set these could be all your different solutions where as the um, um, as a flux go through the network, you could have the entire. You still have all the same, all the same amount that came in to go through the network, but will go through different paths. And at steady state, you could see that this how would that be represented. So once again, I'm um, I put these slides in the so that you can check later. So if I'm going a little bit to uh, fast on it i uh, apologize i'll just want we would just want to switch to k uh after so basically what we have here so we call we have an we have an undetermined system there are three completely independent equal value solutions with possible infinite conditions which one is correct there's that was usually the, the question which one is the would you who is the cell using so uh, so there's many interpretations here for what you want. Sometimes what the, your optimization problem could be you're trying to produce like ethanol as a byproduct. So you would want, so for you, that would be the correct, um, what we call the correct uh, solution. Because, and you try to run your simulation to try to optimize the production of that, uh, of that byproduct. Um, you could just be interested in optimizing biomass production. So that for, in that situation, that would be what you call your, you know, correct solution. Uh, and sometimes you may just, you, you, like in this case, you may want to try to figure out if a, an organism is able to use a pathway that may not be optimal, but you're studying that pathway and you want to make sure to, to see how uh, would work. For example, if you were to knock out this pathway, how would the organism behave then using the other alternative pathway? So it's, this is the, always depends about the question you're trying to, uh, to answer when you're running your, your simulations. So another uh, problem that we have, unfortunately, is that as much as we like this to be kind of a straightforward problem, most of the times uh, when we look at genome annotations, there, there are gaps. There's, uh, there's um, Process, pathways that are not properly described, even if, if you have a, depending on the organism, particularly if, you if you're looking at a, a less known organism that you're studying, um, you would be, you can be in a situation where you can have a pathway, there's, this, there's a couple of steps that were not properly described, and then you have a gap. And when you try to build a model, your model will contain the gap, and, you know, it can be in any of these uh, any of these areas in your genome, and what that means that if you if there's a gap in the network, you may not be able to find a solution when you try to run a simulation. So, and this will happen often unless you are working off you know like uh, publishing uh, a well-known organism. Uh, and for those well-known organisms, there's a likelihood that there's already a, a well-curated model out there that people have been curating for years. So. If you're working with like Saccharomyces or or E. coli, there's several. There's there's at this point there's over a hundred uh, metabolic models that are available in the literature that people did this work where they're trying. They went through and made sure there was no gaps and they did this analysis so that you can properly simulate your genome. But unfortunately, if you are someone that is uh, working with less well-known organisms nowadays. People are doing microbiome studies, so they end up getting hundreds of different isolates that they can't even properly characterize, so you don't have that, that option. So you come in a situation where, for example, if your gap in your network is in something like here, so you don't, you don't, have, the, you don't have the annotation that encodes for the, the enzyme that then encodes for this reaction described, your, your, um, your simulation won't work, will fail, so you won't be able to, uh, to run your analysis. So for that, what we do is we use an algorithm to gap fill, the, um, to gap fill your model. 
Um, here, basically, uh, we use the aforementioned by, by a model seed biochemistry database and includes a wealth of data. And uh, basically, what we try to do is we looked at our entire database that we elected that would for gap fill, and we tried to find what is the minimal number of reactions that we can add to the model so that we, we can fill those gaps and find a solution to your, um, to your, uh, for, your for your simulation. So this, it's, it will depend on the type of carbon source you're trying to gap fill. So there's not just one solution. If you're trying to grow, you may have, depending on the carbon sources your, or nitrogen sources you're trying to grow your organism, you would have to gap fill for those specific growth compounds and uh, gap filling, we always like to say that it's more of a zip code instead of an address because zip, the gap filling doesn't know biology, you know the biology. So it's important that you analyze the, uh, the results of the gap filling because sometimes gap filling can try to cheat by thinking like, uh, for example, if a compound is available in the media, uh, it may just you know gap fill, add a transporter in to bring that into the system instead of gap filling the biosynthetic pathway. So gap filling is an optimization problem, is basically telling you what you, what, what you told it to do that was, can you please find me the minimal number of reactions into, to add into my model so that I can, my organism can grow, I can run this simulation, I can optimize biomass, I can produce this byproduct. So you need to look at that solution, analyze it, and we're going to look how that looks in K-base, but that's something to be aware of is that uh, what are you introducing into your model when you do gap filling? And so now I'm going to just talk a little bit about this uh, before we jump into the, um, into the narrative. So there's this tutorial. So if you're familiar with K-base, you can go to the, your dashboard and in the tutorial section you'll find this microbial metabolic model reconstruction and analysis tutorial. Um, we're gonna kind of glance over it a little bit because it's very comprehensive, but then we just, I'll just open more of a clean narrative. And if you guys wanna follow along, you can also try to follow along a little bit. So, all right, let me just stop here a little bit. Okay. All right, so now, this is the tutorial that I was talking about. For you, it's probably is looking a little bit different than what it looks for me, because for you, it's probably say that you only have view only mode. So this is a good thing. So basically, that means that if you only have view, mo view mode only showing up here, if you're opening this tutorial, it means that, so this is public, you can see it, but you can change it. So this also shows you a little bit how would your narratives look if you share your workflows with someone in KBase? If you were to go to share this with someone, uh, you can give them permissions. And in this case, the reason I can see this differently than you, it's because my colleague, Janneke, that created this tutorial, shared this with me and gave me all the permissions for me to edit and change. So I can do that. But for you, at, you, you only have view permissions, so this may look a little bit different, this interface, but you should have a copy button here that you can copy this narrative, create your own copy, and, also, and once you have your own copy, you can play around with the apps and the data as much as you want. So, so here, I just want to show you uh, a little bit the workflow here. So this is a very useful resource. There's a link to a, a, video, a YouTube video as well, where you can hear my voice if you miss my voice. You can hear my voice um, um, talking about this, uh, how to build a metabolic model in KBase. Also, if you can't find this link, having trouble here, I linked it here, narrative. I li it's linked here in your Q&A uh, &A form. So if you can't find that tutorial. And here we actually talk to you a little bit about, there's details about, about basically a lot of the things that I just told you in that introduction I described here. And we even go about showing you how you'd go about making, you know, like a pretty narrative. You can add pictures. In this case, uh, we made this tutorial because, to analyze this organism that was Shuanella. It's an organism of interest. 
uh, for the DOE and because it has some capabilities that they are interesting for industrial purposes. And then in detail, you can see everything that we was that we did in this tutorial, like building a model and gap filling it. You can see that there's detailed descriptions, a lot of text explaining what's going on in each step. You have a, a lot of text explaining the outputs in detail. So this is a, uh, you see there's the flux balance analysis that I just mentioned, same thing, a lot of text explaining everything in detail. Even tell, shows you how to import a phenotype data set if you have phenotype data to help with your model simulation. So this is a, a pretty, say, we'd say basic introduction, classic workflow that what you would want to do in metabolic modeling. That is, you have, an, you have an isolate, you want to annotate it, you want to build a model, you want to gap fill it, you want to import phenotype data that you have to reconcile with your model. So I recommend you really checking out this tutorial um, after the webinar and uh, for questions, very important. So now I'm just going to switch here to this introduction to meta, to this narrative. So this this is very basic. I can there's no need for you to um, uh, you don't need a link to this one because everything here it's very basic. So the first thing I like to show you is in order to build a model in KBase, you need to annotate your genome with REST. Imagine you have a genome, which can be any genome. And for example, in this case, uh, either you can import your genome by clicking here into KBase. If you go to import, there's an area here where you can import your genome from your local, uh, from your computer. Or if you're working with a public genome, you can go to this public tab. And we have the entirety of RefSeq is here, so you can search for your genome. So in this case, if I like an organism like some bacillus, for example, I could just search for it here and then add it to my narrative. And as you can see now, my genome is here. So I can even let you know, I can, if you're not familiar with KBase, I can click on it and then it shows up here in my narrative area and I can look at these features, I can browse the contigs. So, so the first step that I would have to do is I would have to annotate the, uh, this genome with REST. And you ask me, why do you have to annotate your genome with REST? It's because we, uh, the, the pipeline that we use to build the models uh, relies on REST functional annotations. Um, and we do curation directly of the manual, even manual curation of REST functional annotations to uh, biochemical reactions. So, uh, so that's why this is an, a very important step for you to do that, is that you would, you would want to do, um, you have to annotate your model. I'm gonna show you how now there's functionality for you to do this with other sources of annotation, but I'll leave that uh, for, uh, for a little bit for the end. So basically, so you have, you, you, in order to start, you have a genome that you can either import yourself or, um, get your genome from a public, like in this case. For example, I got this bacillus one, but like if I really like, you know, that Schuanella one that I was showing before, it's like, oh, that tutorial, I, I could search for it here. For example, oh, there we go. I find this Schuanella onidensis, MR1, so I can copy it here. And then what I need to do is, if I search for annotate here, so if you're not familiar and how to run an app in KBase, what you do is you can click in this slide out and see what apps are available. You can search here. In this case, I want to annotate. And you can see here, there's multiple apps. I want this app that is annotate microbial genome. and you know, if I click on this I for more information, it brings me to the dedicated page for that, which explain you basically everything that's going on. It has these, the, uh, the uh, proper related publications. So in this case, if I do annotate, genome annotation, I'll be able to do annotate microbial genome. So 
So if you are someone that works with Rust already and you already have Rust annotated genomes, then you do you you don't need to do this this step. You just have to bring upload to KBase your Rust annotated genome already. If you uh, we know there's a lot of researchers that already use uh, Rust annotation. So if that's for you, what you use, then, uh, then 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 it's not a problem for you anymore. Um, so and then it's very simple. I'll select my Schwannella genome. So as you can see here, uh, this is filtering for all the genomes that are available in my narrative. I want this Schwannella one, and then I'll say my annotation, and I hit run, and this is ba then this should take a couple of this should take like no more than five minutes to run. Assume uh, when it starts running. For example, now I got queued, but like a cooking show i actually already ran this earlier this morning so that i can show you the finished result so basically once that's finished running you'll get something like this you'll get this report where it shows you um all right you see my annotations already started running and you should finish in uh, in a few minutes so but you'll get a report like this showing you the number of features that were annotated in your genome it tells you about the distinct seed functions that were annotated and then you can also browse these features so now you have an annotated genome and you can browse features so like immediately you want to make sure like i really need to make sure i'm studying this enzyme you know i don't know like pyruvate kinase is just an example let me make sure that that got properly annotated because if if the enzyme that you were interested in studying it's um it's not properly um it's not properly annotated um then you can't you would not be able to um they will never show up in a model if 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 for the annotation you're interested in uh, in studying or the set of pathways or reactions are not there so just you can you can browse your so you have your genome you can browse your genome here then the next step that you have to do is just build a model. So all that you want to do now is build a model. And same way, if you search here, you would be like, okay, build metabolic model. You see like an app shows up here. And if I click on the I for information here, it brings me to the page. And here actually explains you very well in detail why you need to annotate first. So the documentation he tells you, you need why you need to annotate with uh, with REST functional ontology. And also here, it's a cool thing for you to see. You can see here also some statistics on this app. You can see that this app. So there has been over sixty thousand models built on KBase. You can see that it was successful, ran without an error, uh, 93% per of the times, and the average time for a run. Um, this dep will depend on the size of your genome. And before I do this, I... All right, you have your genome. Before we do this, I'm just going to jump really quickly back to my slides because... I'm going to do one thing is I could just run this right now as is, but I want to show you the the beta functionality. I want you to switch to beta in your model. And from in, I want to explain you why I want you to do that. So before we do that, I'm just going to switch back to my slides really quickly here. So you can see there's this slide here showing you upcoming functionality or available in beta, how to switch to beta. And the main reason I'm doing this, it's because of a couple of things. First, um, there is, like I told you before, support for reconstruction with additional uh, sources of annotation. If you don't want to annotate with RAS, such CAD KOs, gene ontology, direct EC numbers. And this is a uh, work done by Patrick de Hassler, uh, hopefully I'm not butchering his name, team at Lawrence Livermore. And this is a great example for everyone listening on how you can work with KBase. So this was a recurring theme. People come to us and they would say, tell us, I really love your tools, but you know, I, we really work with these CAG annotations. It's really important for us. We have an entire lab curating on this uh, annotation ontology. 
and we really want to be able to build models on these annotations or we just want to use a bunch of different annotations. So they had this publication about it, how the advantage of combining multiple function annotation tools. And so what did they did, they came to us and said, can we work with you so that we add this functionality to your model reconstruction pipeline? So this is uh, a prime example in how the community came together to help us uh, add additional functionality. And so we're very excited about this. And for anyone out there, there is an app developer. This is a great example where if you, there's a functionality that you have that you want to augment or complement our tools uh, to help the community, you can, come, you can come to us, you can contact me directly or the help board. Um, and, uh, and, and we can start a conversation to see how we can work together to possibly bring that functionality in Kbase. So this yielded a couple of new apps that I can show, but basically you were able to import just a, a simple table file uh, with your gene ID, with your feature IDs and the extra annotation, combine all those annotations into you, into your genome, and then select those annotations to build your model. So this is um, just so that you are aware. I'm not going to dive deep into it, but this is just so that you're aware. This is a uh, an option now that was done by a third party developer, not uh, working with us. And feel free to test these apps and, and send feedback. And the other reason we're switching to beta for the model reconstruction, it's because we noticed that we had an issue with the ATP production in some of the models that we had. So we're testing a new, uh, a new uh, way to um, build our models to uh, fix our ATP production. So I'm just gonna go here very quickly. So basically we had an issue where you, uh, you would have ATP production that as we were building the model, a nefarious reaction would be added to the model one at a time. And then all of a sudden the ATP production would skyrocket to a, a, a very large amount and let that, that would deal to like unrealistic uh, productions. So basically all that we did was just modify uh, in simplest terms was modify the uh, reconstruction algorithm to prevent this from happening so that we can have more realistic ATP productions. And the same thing when we gap fill, as I told you before, when we're gap filling a model, there was a chance that we introduce a gap filling, uh, a gap -filling solution that would introduce like a, a nefarious reaction maybe, uh, that would do the same thing, uh, would skyrocket the ATP production. So if that happens, we reject that gap fill solution and try to gap fill again until we find a solution that doesn't cause this problem. So just a very high level reason of why uh, we recommend you right now that you build your models in the beta app. So this means that it's in testing, but you can also help us test and, and send feedback. Um, and for example, this you can see here, just uh, maybe a more visual way of seeing that. So depending on the model and on the media that you were running before, uh, because of the some some issues with ATP uh, ATP um, production, you could have parts of your TCA cycle not being properly working properly in your model. And now in beta, which will be in this in the upcoming release of the model seed, uh, this is not a problem anymore. So yeah, like uh, the full functionality. So that was just I would just like you guys to uh, be aware of that when and why we're switching to beta. So. This is also a cool way to let you, I think, in Kbase, to let you be able to uh, try the latest and greatest functionality available. And for this case, uh, yeah, feel free to leave us, leave us feedback as you, uh, if you are someone that was already using the, the modeling and uh, wants to try out the, the beta version. So what am I gonna do is, I'm just gonna click here and switch to beta. If you can see now, we have a warning telling you you're entering beta mode. Uh, so, so that you know that some of the apps here may not be fully fledged out. They're still being tested. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to release this app soon. But so if I s search for build metabolic model here, there will be a build metabolic model app. And then here you can see what, what is it that you need? You need a genome. And in this case, we want to use my annotation that I just did. As you can see, it's already finished. It's telling you that finished seven minutes ago, so it was actually worked very quickly. 
Then he's asking you what is the gap filling media that you want to use. So if you remember my slides from um, 20 minutes ago, we're talking about how you may need to, uh, you need to gap fill your model to uh, get the gaps in the annotation filled in and you need to select a, a media. So the media that you select here, it depends on what you're trying to study. So if you want to, uh, if you're trying to study an organism that grows on uh, xylos, for example, you'd want to um, gap fill in a xylos media to make sure that the specific pathways that will process xylos would be, um, would be properly represented. You can also not select a gap, uh, a gap filling media. And if you see here, it tells you that if you don't select a gap filling media, defaults to complete media. And if I over over it, you can see here a tooltip. So basically complete media, uh, it, what it does is it's the richest media you can imagine. So basically if you basically what it assumes is if your model as a transporter, that compound exists in the media. So if you have a transporter, the compound exists in the media. So it's a super rich media. And uh, when I present this, some people are, sometimes they tell me, well, that doesn't sound like very realistic. Why would I want to get filled to this complete media? And it can actually be useful for you to, um, it helps you learn, uh, get some, uh, an idea of the overall possible metabolic capabilities of your model because it's uh, using, it's looking at everything, all the transporters that it has and everything that could possibly be transported into the model. So that's one, um, that's one possible um, usage of complete media. It's also very useful. It's something that I commonly do on my research to do like a minimal media formulation and then, and also the complete media and compare both. So by comparing the different solutions to see, uh, uh, to see what is it that it's part of one and the other, that can also give you some insights about your, uh, your gap filling um, and what it's missing in your, um, in your original annotation. So in this case, we can, I want just, no, I, I know that I wanna grow this in glucose. And what I did is actually, so if I go here and click on the plus and go to public, you can see, here there's a slide out and there's media and if i click on media uh there's over 500 minimal media formulations that we have here there's some rich media but the majority of these would, would describe minimal like biolog type conditions and what i did all i did in this case was i found this carbon d glucose and i just i just added into my narrative so if you're following along in an empty narrative that's something you can do um, yourself. So very simple. I annotated the, uh, I get my model. I select that I want to gap filling carbon D glucose. Then the next step is template for reconstruction. So this is very important too, where in, the, uh, in this case, uh, we, you have what you see here, automatic selection. Um, so the automatic selection here basically is going to look at some of the components of your genome and is going to try to decide what is it that you're trying to build. For example, you can see we have a gram negative and a gram positive template. So one of the, the main the, the differences will be the cell wall components. So for example, what the algorithm will try to do, it will try to see uh, are those cell wall related functional roles in your genome? And if they are, it'll try to make that decision for you. But if you already know, you can search the template because uh, to, for that, that we also have a plant template. We also have a dedicated plant apps, uh, but I'm not gonna touch on that today. So I think we, uh, in the future, we may want to have a dedicated um, plant metabolic modeling webinar because uh, plants uh, uh, will have a slightly different workflow than for uh, the prokaryotes. So, and also you have core metabolism, also very important, very cool here. If all you want, it's a metabolism of just the energy of core metabolism and energy biosynthesis. Um, you can use that. I mean, there's a very, a very good uh, paper recently by the Daniel Sagres group where they, um, they did a very comprehensive analysis only using, uh, for a large amount of organisms, only using core models uh, built here. 
um, with this functionality. So in this case, I can leave it as automatic. And then you here you have the gap filling model or not. So here you can at this step gap fill your model or not. It's up to you. Maybe you just want a draft model. Basically, you just want to see like you don't want to interested in simulating this model, at least not at this point. You just want to see what reactions map from the genome uh, to the uh, to which biochemical reactions you can get from mapping to your genome. So you don't introduce any gap filling. You're just mapping your annotations to biochemical reactions. So you could uncheck this. If you later decide to use your, uh, to want to gap fill your model, you can still use a separate application called get a gap fill metabolic model to then gap fill your draft model. So it's up to you. So in this case, I could just go ahead and do it. Just check gap fill and then just say my new, my webinar gap filled model. It doesn't like spaces, so I could just hit run and I built a model. So then the, the model, the model reconstruction will, will kick start. So to recapitulate, all that I did to, to build to start was I started by I annotated a genome, as you can see, it happened 30 minutes ago. I brought my genome to a KBase. I annotated the genome with RAST. Now I selected that RAST model to annotate with KBase. Pretty straightforward. So if I do a build model again, build metabolic model. I can also show you one more thing as that runs, is that, so if I select this, this isn't, so there's also a bunch of advanced parameters in here is where if you are interested in using the uh, aforementioned other sources of annotation that we mentioned here, um, you would be able to do that. So if there's a lot of interest in this topic, we can uh, talk with the, um, with the developers of this app and maybe they can also give a, we a webinar for this functionality. I think that would be really cool. So if that's something you wanna see, you can leave that feedback. But basically what we would do is here, you would be able to say like, I wanna merge all selected annotations. And then you can even prioritize annotation sources. Imagine you imported Go and CAG and um, all the, their sources that they allow, you would be able to, uh, uh, you would be able to select which one you want to be used first to build your model and prioritize. So that's a very cool feature. So that's, that's how you'd go about using those uh, additional sources of annotation to build your model. So if you want to hear more about it, uh, just uh, let, us, uh, let, us, let us know and we can, uh, we, can, we can possibly work on that. So, so we have a model. So as you can see, my model is running. So usually things run really quickly. Uh, that's the thing. So you don't need to run anything in your machine. So you can even at this point, uh, just close your browser and come back later to find your model. But in this case, I already done this before. And as you can see, like before I run as a draft and it tells you a new draft genome scale metabolic model was based on the annotations. No gap filling was performed. It, was expect, it is expected that the model will not be capable of producing growth on any biomass until the gap fill is run So, and give you some information. So this is actually really cool. It's telling you already that if you didn't gap fill, uh, what, what may happen? And when you look at the output of your model, you get this, just some general information about the number of reactions. And then if you click on reactions tab, you can see that you have the reaction IDs, you have the reaction names, you have equations, and you have the genes associated with them. Since you can see there's no gap filling because we did in the gap fill. And that you can also look at the compounds, all the compounds in the model will be here. Listed, you can see all the genes too that are available. So your, your, gene, your genes and what reactions are associated with each gene. You can see the compartments are in the model. In this case, it's extracellular and uh, cytosol. You can see the components of your bio, the biomass reaction. 
as you can see, there's no gap. There's, in this case, I've done reference glucose minimal media, if you were, you could see if there was a gap filling or not. And, and then you have pathways where you can click on a map and it'll bring you like a, ma a CAG map showing you if what components of the pathway are present in your model. So we're working on better visualization apps. If you're someone that um, was here for the advanced metabolic modeling, we're working on improving our metabolic visualization to, uh, to use Azure, basically, so you can have visualization more like this versus using CAG maps. But that, as of now, that's what it's uh, available for you here. And so I can close this. Also, this is cool. I'm very glad that everything is running. So this just finished a minute ago. So this is a model that I'm running live as I do the webinar. So this is, uh, um, so in this case, you get uh, telling you that the model was reconstructed, that the gap filling was ran, and what reactions were added. You get, to, you get a list of the reactions that were added during gap filling. So, and this is when you go here and try to figure out, okay, why was this reaction added? Was this was this truly missing? I can see here, for example, oh, it seems that some um, transporter were added, that, is, that it made sense that this was added, was this compound in the media? So there's all of these, this analysis that we have to do, like you, to figure out uh, how, uh, if, um, if you trust the results of the biomass or, or, or not, like uh, you as the ultimate expert. So that will be one thing for you to do. So if you just want to build draft models, you say like, no, I just want to build a draft model and I want to, I want to be able to later on gap fill. So you can do that. You can search for the gap fill, gap fill metabolic model, and you'll select, okay, I have my, my draft and now I want to gap fill it. I can do this media. You can gap fill in mul in different media. Keep adding media and doing multiple gap fills, and they will sh and they will show up too. So my new gap fill. So this way, you have both a draft model that you can look without any gap filling, and then you have a gap fill model so you could compare two and easily see what was added, what wasn't added. Um, for example, if I want to compare what the gap filled model has that the other one doesn't, I could go here. And if I go to compare models, for example, compare, and I look at about my, I could go here. In this case, just switch to the release version. If I search for compare models, metabolic modeling, and there's a compare models function. And I'll be able to say, all right, let me compare my draft model, my model draft with my gap field model. And, you know, comparison. So I'll be able to compare those, run a comparison for that. And then after I'm done doing all of this, so uh, I have annotated a genome, I built a model, I gap field, I compare, look at the gap field. You may want to run, as we discussed in the introduction, uh, flux balance analysis. So if you want to run flux balance analysis, same way, you just have to search for the flux balance analysis app. So I would go here and run flux balance analysis, and I would be able to select my gap field model, select the media I want to run my flux balance analysis. It can be carbon D glucose, and then here, I'll do. I'll be able to do, say, FBA result. And a couple of important parameters here would be, you can see that in this case, biomass is being, it selects reaction to maximize. So it's selection bio one, which is the name of your biomass reaction. So what all the model will try to do, it will try to maximize the production of biomass. But if you want, you were to want to, to do uh, something different, like, oh, I want to optimize the production of a byproduct, you could remove that here 
and then find the transporter that exports that uh, the uh, byproduct out of the system and select that at what, what you want to uh, optimize, uh, maximize. So would maximize the production of, um, of that uh, uh, exporting that byproduct out of the cell. And that could give you an idea of how would the organism behave if all that it was trying to do was maximize the production of that, of that uh, byproduct while producing some biomass still. So in this case, we're gonna stay with bio one. And then when you look at the advanced spectrometers here, so I'm not gonna go in details here. I think this will be a topic for an advanced metabolic modeling workshop where there's a lot going on here that you can do to tune your simulation uh, that is out of the scope of an introduction. But uh, one of the important things you could do if you were to want to simulate gene knockouts here, there's an option for gene knockouts where you would type the genes that you want to knock out to run that simulation. If you were to want to knock out react reactions directly, you could just select the reactions you want to knock out and add them to your simulation. So that's something you could do here too. But so that's something for you to explore. And then you can ask questions for any of these. You could add expression data to simulate with this. So there's a lot of you can do here, but this will be a little bit off topic. So this is the introduction to metabolic modeling. So let's hide the advanced. And so you could just hit run and then you would run your flux balance analysis. Seems that we had an error here. Oh, I, I guess I selected a duplicated model. Okay, yeah, that was my mistake. Yeah, you shouldn't, uh, yeah, you shouldn't, uh, do what I just did, do select the same model. And um, let me just do here if I go and reset. And I can run again. So very quickly, I was able to run again, as you can see. So the my flex balance analysis is running and as that finishes, I'm going to just a, show you how that looks because we're getting it to time. So it tells you that um, your analysis was performed. And then when I look at the report, you can see here you have an objective value. So there was growth. This is in uh, grams per mole per milliliter of dry weight here. And then you can look at individual reaction fluxes. You can look at your exchange fluxes again. We can go through all of this in detail uh, in a more advanced uh, workshop. You can see your genes. In this case, there was no knockouts that we did. So that you see at zero, your biomass numbers. And here, ideally, particularly if you're not very well versed uh, into the metabolic model, in flux balance analysis in particular, it's very daunting for you to dive into these tables, you know, like a 1200 row table with numbers to try to understand what's going on. Um, so ideally you wanna use pathway visualization, like in this case, we'll paint you the fluxes uh, on, the, uh, on the map um, so that you can see how the fluxes are going through these maps. Again, these are not the, uh, the maps could use improvement. And we also want to use the same Asher maps to show you more clearly in the upcoming version how the flux is running through the um, how the flux is running through the through your network. So this is what I have as like the utmost basic. And again, if you look at this tutorial uh, done by my colleague Janica, it goes into some more details and how to um, do gap filling and how to upload and uh, um, and how to upload an express as phenotype data set. You can also revisit this YouTube video here uh, where you can hear me talk in detail about this uh, again, if you want to hear my voice. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that for now and thank all the over 100 people that stayed until the end. I think this was even more successful than our my latest webinar. So I really appreciate you sticking around and now um, I'm just going to switch over here and look at some questions. And if you have some more questions, uh, Ben, uh, I think uh, that's it. Yeah, there's um, there's a couple of open questions here on the uh, 
on the uh, document that you might want to take a stab at while people are still on. Um, All right, so all in the document, yeah, please don't ask if he, is there questions in the chat? Okay. Okay, after following to a tutorial and running an app exactly following the tutorial. Oh, so the annotated model shows less number of reactions. I actually seen this. I think uh, this is for this question here. I think I'm just gonna copy it here too. Um, so actually I've seen this happen before was that the, um, it was because of the use we have to update uh, this tutorial because uh, I'll just have to update the tutorial because there may be an issue where there's an old version of the genome object being used and uh, the newest version of the model uh, building app it's uh, is having some conflicts with the older version of the genome and causes that so all that we have to do is uh, uh, is update that to that old genome object and uh, make sure we maintain the backwards com uh, compatibility between newer versions and older versions of the model. So I have seen I've seen that happen actually um, before. So like if you uh, you shouldn't worry about that if you're building a model. Just uh, if you particularly uh, the tutorial it just gives you an idea of a work of the workflow. If you have your own data, if you annotate with the, the genome today and build a model today, you, you won't see what like a discrepancy on that. So um, I'm just gonna paste an answer here because I've seen that happen before. Uh, um, yeah, so. Um, should not be an issue with current version of the apps. We will update the tutorial. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, this one at the top that I uh, didn't know the best answer to where they're asking about bringing in eukaryotic genomes. Um, so as far as eukaryotic uh, Uh, so for eukaryotes, so I, I'm not a uke specialist, so I can tell, I can't tell you which one should you really be focusing. Um, uh, I can tell you that for the, um, uh, I can tell you that you should try the best thing you can do is try, it would be to try more, um, whatever, maybe try them all, try them each one in different combinations. Uh, I mainly focus on the, um, on the reconstruction of the uh, of prokaryotes. So particularly like if you are those to build a model, we're talking about eukaryotes, fungal. We have an app that is dedicated just for fungal modeling that we didn't touch here. So I think I should, I should mention that the apps that we showed were focused, were more fo focusing on prokaryotes because they, they work really well for prokaryotes, but uh, they were not being optimized for uh, for you to run with Dukes. So you can run FBA, you can run all the apps, but the building, the building model apps specifically, uh, they were more optimized for prokaryotes. So if you bring those extra annotations, you should be able to build a model, but um, using the, uh, the third party application, but I really can't tell you which one to focus because I'm not, a, I'm not an expert of which one would work best. Uh, for um, microcosm or phytosome plants. So for phytosome, for plants, I know that we have a dedicated, we have dedicated plant annotation, we have dedicated plant um, building applications that uh, plant that I can show here, if you're interested in plants. So you can see there's this reconstruct plant metabolism app. Uh, if I do plant, yeah, so you do for plants in particular, you want to use the annotate plant transcripts with metabolic functions app, and then reconstruction of plant metabolism. And you'll be able to do that. So, and you're able to run these. 
There's also a beta, there's also a fungal modeling app uh, specific for fungi, but that, that we're still working on. But as far as br the question that is, which one should you focus as far as bringing in? Um, I honestly, my suggestion as a researcher, I'll just try them all. I'll try them all individually. I'll try them all in combination. I'll try them all until I figure out what works best. Um, yep, I see that's yeah. For eukaryotes, the best point of entry is bringing an annotated genome rather than annotating in KBase for now, exactly. And you can use that. Yeah, so answer that. So that's what I would uh, that's what I would do. I know that that may be not the answer you want to hear, but that's <laughs> uh that's usually what I do when I'm trying to do my own metabolic modeling uh studies and I have multiple sources of annotation that I want to use. I just try them all and I try them in different combinations and prioritizations until I figure out what works best. So all right, I see some more one thing I added there, there's a couple questions about if there's a, a, a resource on KBase for published models. So I shared that organization that folks okay. started up that if folks want to join that. Uh, and I guess, I mean, are the models that are in the public uh, data tab, are those still uh, useful? And in the public, there's no models. There's okay, only me enough. there's only media. There's only media. Also, mm -hmm. Ben, can you share? There's the uh, metabolic modeling FAQ. Mm -hmm. Yes. Modeling. So FAQ. K base. So if you search for metabolic modeling FAQ K base, there's actually it brings you to this page where there's a lot of a lot of questions that had been answered already from previous from inquiries so that's also very another helpful resource yeah put that at the top and then in the chat as well okay so yeah um follow yep so i think we most of the questions were answered. So, um, please, oh, uh, can I change the biomass composition? Yeah, so you can change the biomass composition. Um, um, uh, so there's a lot going on here. Wow, there's a lot of questions. Um, yeah, we may, uh, we, 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 we may just, uh, so, so to, instead of typing, <laughs> so we'll, we'll go through later, but like, uh, what is the timeline for the Azure visualization if known? Um, we hopefully would want to have something to release by, you know, I'd say summer, end of summer would be a good estimate. Um, it would be the timeline that I would like for you this to happen, but the current situation and uh, is not, not helping developing, moving faster unfortunately uh with some of the people that we needed to have engaged in the team and uh still adapting to work from home and and whatnot so it's kind of delaying some of these but um i would like to say uh i'd like to, to say uh yeah end of summer that would be a, a more cons uh, that would be a good uh, more conservative estimate for that like early yeah uh, when can i ask the recording for metabolic modeling um I'll, I'll send it to everybody uh, after. So for to find Saccharomyces, uh, so again, if you're trying to do Saccharomyces, um, I'm trying to understand. I was unable to find Saccharomyces as a template to gap fill. Is this for the fungal modeling? Because for Saccharomyces, you should be trying to find, use the fungal modeling build an app, the dedicated one. So I'm just going to glance over these a little bit quickly, and then we try to get some more detailed answers there. Uh, can I use annotations from different strains to improve my model? So as far as annotations from different strains, like so you would have to combine all, you would have to combine these into a um, um, you would have to um, combine all if you were able to combine all these annotations in one in one model, sure, you could do that. You could do that, for example, if you're able to edit your genome to say, um, 
uh, to point to make sure that you make a note on the annotations what was the source of if it came from another strain you should be able to add all those annotations there like you kind of you can create kind of like a franken genome with all the annotations that you want including including um, um, multiple strains and then build a model for it so like you could edit your you could edit your GenBank file, for example, include as many annotations from different strains as you want, upload that genome in, and then build a model for it. You could do that. Like, there's no direct way, as far as an application in a system right now, to uh, use different strains to like feed into one model, at least not at the moment. You would have to create basically that genome that would have all of those different strains, annotations. How do you add phenotypic data to the model, uh, such as RNA-seq? Uh, let me go through. Can you change the biomass composition? Yes. Uh, so there is a um, edit metabolic model app. If here, edit metabolic model. Uh, and edit media for that part if you want to edit the media formulation for example but so the, med, the this app can be a little bit there's a lot of options and can be a little bit quirky so if you try to use it and have problems you can submit a ticket or let us know but if you're having a lot of problems using uh, doing this um at times what i recommend uh is to particularly if you want to do a lot of changes uh doing it in an app may just not be as efficient as the app is designed right now you could download uh, your model, like you would go to download, download as an SVML, and uh, make all of your changes locally and then re-import into Kbase. So that's not the ideal because um, ideally, so in Kbase, we want to ca capture all the provenance. So we want to capture all the steps, all the changes that happen so that it is reproducible. But if you're looking to do a lot of changes and it's doing it all in this app is not very efficient, uh, that would be another solution. It would be downloading, doing doing locally, and then re-uploading back into the system. And if you if you're doing that and worried about keeping the provenance, I would say like I could add like a markup cell and say like, hey, I did the following changes offline for example. So you could try to do something like that to document that, but so that's that this app would allow you to do that. But if you're going to do a lot of changes, it may be, uh, may not be as efficient as doing it locally um, until we improve the, uh, the, this app. So let me go more a little bit. Can you use the meta, the model on environmental genomes that are not being isolated yet? You can. So we talked about this a little bit on the, um, on the uh, on the advanced one, so in beta, you can even build a model directly from a metagenome if you have a metagenome now. For example, you can build a metagenome model where you can take uh, either an, imp an input assembly, uh, an uh, assembly metagenome, or a bins bin bins from metagenome bins to build a model. If you already, if you have reads, you can actually do all of that in Kbase. Uh, if you want to start with reads in Kbase, you can. Uh, you could start by um, assembling. You could start by importing your metagenomic reads. Then you'd be able to do. Uh, you would be able to do a microbial. If you look at microbial communities, you could, for example, assemble with uh, your reads with something like IDBA and Metaspades. You could use like max bin into the system to bin your metagenome, and then you could use that to build models. You can um, you can also if you have multiple models, you can use these the merge metabolic modeling app to merge models into a community model. So there's a lot that we could be talking about here. Particularly on this case, I think Ben, there is an upcoming microbiome webinar, correct? Yes, that's um, uh, ne next week, maybe? Let me check. Or the 15th. So on this question in particular, there is, um, there, is a, there will be a, a dedicated uh, kind of microbiome modeling uh, webinar coming that recommend you checking. 
Uh, is it possible to import export models from SPML to SPML last publications? Yes, uh, that is correct. We're using the latest version. Uh, so right now the export, uh, the exporter in Kbase, um, exporter in Kbase <coughs> is the latest Cobra Pi, is the latest uh, Cobra Pi exporter. Yeah, exporter in Kbase is the latest Cobra Pi SPML exporter. So, uh, so does the, then can you, uh, how can you add phenotype data to this model such as RNA-seq? So this is something that we covered a little bit more on the advanced one. So you can, so if you look at the, um, so you, if you have RNA-seq, uh, you can, for example, uh, you can do also your entire RNA-seq da and data analysis in Kbase if you have reads. Uh, you can also import your RNA-seq data, your expression matrices into Kbase already. But uh, you can also do your entire RNA-seq analysis here. We have the entire Tuxedo pipeline available if you want to do that. And there's even tutorials available on Kbase on you how to do your RNA-seq data analysis here in our tutorials so if that's something you want to do but so what would you do here is you could so if you look at the build metabolic model for example on the build metabolic model you'll be able to if you have uh if you have a an expression matrix that you have uploaded you'd be able to When you run your FPA, you will be able to select here, for example, the uh, expression data that you want to use. For, if you want to use an expression data set, you will be able to select the expression data set here, for example. I want to use this expression data, this, matri this expression matrix, and then you will be able to select here even which specific conditions on that data set you're trying to select and then th set them thresholds to call reactions on and off. So that's, again, it's more a little bit more advanced functionality, but that is possible. And for biolog, for biolog data, you can follow the, uh, the tutorial because that's exactly what we do here. We use a biolog data set in this example. So you can follow here to see exactly how we did it. Uh, does it does an existing API to access it from other sites from the command line that is that does not exist uh, at the moment um, it's uh, I, I can't tell you a, a timeline for that either because so the main goal of the project is to uh, one of the main goals of Kbase is to keep provenance of data and reproducibility so we uh, with the idea that you do uh, you'd be able you do uh, if you do your analysis in the system we're able to capture uh, every step and know the analysis that was done. Um, so that's why, for example, I was bringing that comment earlier that if for the edits, ideally, uh, if you have to do a lot of edits and do edits offline and bring it up, we're kind of bringing, breaking that provenance chain. But uh, that's kind of the goal of the project. And so at the moment, we are not providing API access for the metas for the command lines. I can honestly can't say if that's always going to be the case, but as of now, I know that there's no plan for that to be the case. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so this is, yeah, so this is, uh, okay. Yeah. This is basically, if you're familiar with Jupyter notebooks, uh, basically Kbase is built on top of a Jupyter notebook. And even though this is a more advanced, this is an intro. If you are someone that is advanced, you can even, you know, write some code here and run these apps programmatically instead of clicking all these widgets too. So that's something you could do. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail here. Maybe we can do a webinar more about those functionalities, but that's uh, for a later topic. And I think we went through most questions. Right, Ben? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh... We covered it, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll try to uh, update some of these answers on the document. Um, 
and flesh out some of the details. But um, yeah, the link for this will stay open. So, um, but yeah, thanks everybody. And, and again, encourage you all to use the, um, you know, the FAQs and the tutorials uh, and the publications that are out there um, that cover uh, how to do this, um, this process. Yeah. Based. Yeah, I was going to say here, like, if you're looking at flux balance analysis, I did such a little detail. This classic paper, what is flux balance analysis, is a good source for it. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there that I usually do with our students. Like, if you find, uh, if you search on YouTube, you should be able to find Bernard Paulson's uh, class, uh, UCSD class on YouTube where he does an amazing job explaining all the basics and even more, if you want to get into the field and learn more about metabolic modeling, he does a great job on it. If you search for UCSD uh, systems biology, Bernard Paulson classes on YouTube, you should be able to find these classes and they were very helpful um, as well uh, if you're trying to get into this field. So that's another recommendation there. So uh, yeah, so this is all we had and uh, yeah, feel free to, uh, to uh, contact me if you have any more questions and uh, hopefully everyone uh, uh, stays healthy. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching this webinar. For more webinars and tutorials, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can see announcements for upcoming webinars and recordings for previous webinars on our website at kbase.us learn. Let us know in the comments what content you'd like to see in future webinars. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at DOE KBase. And if you have questions or encounter an error when using KBase, please contact the help desk.